All right, well, welcome to uh, session number five, COVID and health. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, whichever time zone you're in. I understand that we are, uh, have participants from literally around the world. So uh, that's a wonderful fitting tribute to the Fulbright Association. I'm Don Sparks. I'll be moderating this session this afternoon. Uh, I'm on the board of the Fulbright Association, uh, past president of the South Carolina State Chapter of the Fulbright Association. And I've had uh, Fulbrights in uh, East Watini, which used to be called Swaziland, in uh, Laos, Ethiopia, and Slovenia. I'm very fortunate. But enough about me. We have a very exciting panel uh, this afternoon. And I must tell you before we start, this uh, <clears throat> conference, this virtual conference, has come a long way to cure my Zoomophobia. Uh, it's a good remedy for, for Zoom overload. It's been a great conference so far. Let's continue that progress. This afternoon, we have four um, speakers. I'll ask each speaker to limit their presentation to a maximum of 15 minutes. If they go 13 or 14, that's, that's fine. But I'll try to, I'll give you a one minute warning at 15 minutes. Uh, after, I'll introduce each speaker uh, in turn, after which, uh, after all the speakers have had a chance to give the presentation, we'll open up the floor to uh, the audience. I'll ask all the attendees to please put in questions in the Q&A uh, folder at the bottom of your screen. Please put in questions, be specific as you can. If you wanna direct them to a particular speaker, please do so, feel free to do so. And I will try to incorporate those questions towards the end of the presentation. I believe that's as far as we have for uh, introductions and uh, rules and regulations. Uh, you know where the restroom is presumably and that sort of thing. So uh, be, be, be feel free to excuse yourself if you need to. Violet Barton is our first presenter. Violet is a PhD candidate at UC Merced. Um, she's looking at very, very interesting topic of indigenous people in Western El Salvador, looking at how those people suffered, of course, under colonial rule and, and the diseases that the Spanish brought and how they're dealing with, with the COVID uh, pandemic with indigenous health uh, care. So I'm very excited to hear about this presentation. Violet, uh, the floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you, Professor Sparks. Um, where do we go from here? Uh, this morning, I will um, share with you Nahua people's feminisms, cosmovision, and life in Kushkatan. I acknowledge that all local indigenous people embrace their continued connections to the land. And I thank them this morning for allowing us to live, work, learn, and collaborate in their homeland. I humbly ask her permission to share these knowledges from mis abuelos y abuelas, past, present, and future. Where are we going? We came only to be born. Our home is beyond, is in the realm of the flesh ones I suffer. Happiness, good fortune never comes my way. Have I come here to struggle in vain? This is not the place to accomplish things. Certainly nothing grows green the here. Misfortunes opens its blossoms. This poem is from the Nahua, people, Nahua uh, peoples in um, the Mexica, the code of the Shimalpopoca written, recorded in 1558, right? So I wanted to share with you this little bit of Nahua, Nahua philosophy where you can contemplate their way of thinking about life and the harsh conditions that they had to endure after colonization. The Nahua people are considered the original inhabitants of Cushcatan along the Lencas, Mayas, and Cacaoperas. Linguistic, archaeological, and historical evidences demonstrate their descendancy from Uto Aztecan and Toltec families that migrated southward from Xoconochco, Tehuantepec, through Mixtlan and its Quintlan towards the Itzalcu region around 800 AD, settling between the territories of Rio Ceniza and Rio Lempa in the part of the isthmus that today is known as the Republic of El Salvador. Disease has been devastating the existence of the original peoples of Abiyayala since colonial time. COVID-19 conditions are not a new experience for surviving Nahua people communities in Cushcatan. 
Cuscata means place of jewels in Nahuapipi. Research about indigenous depopulation in the isthmus during the colonial administration highlights that from the moment of first contact in 1524 until independence in, from Spain in 1821, the indigenous population that survived, particularly in the region of El Salvador, barely made up 14% of the total indigenous population at the time of first contact, right? And so the maps that you're seeing is the region um, where I was very fortunate to have received a Fulbright grant to conduct research. And um, basically, you know, emerging from the historical or inherited memory of Nahua people elders in Western Cushcatan and recognizing the danger that COVID-19 poses through the, their existence. My paper centers the indigenous women's sacred uh, circle as a strategy of commun communal survivance that through ancestral knowledges and praxis seeks to redignify the immense physical and especially a spiritual labor of indigenous women. To the Nahua people, it is women who have been central to indigenous survivance during each moment of historical crisis that they have overcome. Invasion, occupation, epidemics, natural catastrophes, massacres, or wars, and still forced displacement today. As she has been the constant figure that has always protected life and carried forward their sense of community. The Sacred Women's uh, Circle is a space of life dedicated to healing and nurturing one another. By surviving, I mean Gerald Bissonor's uh, definition of native active presence over absence, the continuance of stories, renunciations of dominance, the feeling of tragedy, and the legacy of victimry. As the Pueblos Originarios de Aviayala, the, the Nahua people depart from inherited memory of their struggles to understand name and confront each of the social problems and structural violences they have experienced and continue to experience today. It is from the inherited memory of the struggles of their grandmothers and grandfathers that they propose the colonial solutions toward el buen vivir or, or good life for their communities as they face COVID-19. From this way of thinking and seeing the world, Nahua people women bear a significant responsibility to protect lives and community including embracing the struggles for land and water in the midst of this pandemic, carrying on their backs and on their hearts, their spirituality and worldview as an embodied proposal to solve the problems that they are confronted with daily and that are deeply rooted in the context of the colonial matrix of power that as scholars Walter Mignolo and Maria Lugones note has not yet ended. For instance, the structural violence to which Nahua people communities have been subjected to for centuries is manifested in their perpetual impoverishment, in their lack of access to dignified and remunerative work, in their lack of access to healthcare, safe transportation and housing, dedicated subsistence agricultural land to, good, to grow nutritional food and to access drinking water, in their lack of access to education and linguistic justice, in the impunity of organized crime, in the forced internal and external displacement and dispossession from the land and from water, in the exploitation of their labor, in the inhumane imprisonment conditions, the closure of borders, the prolonged detention and separation of indigenous families at borders, and in the high femicide rates in the country and more. These are conditions of death for native peoples in El Salvador that they face daily and that they are silenced, right? These conditions of death take on new meanings in the face of COVID-19 pandemic, given that in moments of global uncertainty and panic, inequality, racism, sexism, exploitation, extractivism and of resources from our mother earth and other forms of state repression against indigenous communities increase. In this context, COVID-19 is devastating indigenous populations around the world including the Nahua people, exposing them to increased risks for contagion, hospitalization, and death in a system that is on the verge of collapsing, which has disproportionate impact on the most vulnerable bodies and is evident in the lack of access to verified health information, internet, and basic personal protective equipment such as masks, soap, and water. Meanwhile, the one who provides the labor of love care and healing for those who fall ill 
is the indigenous woman who prepares the masa for the tortillas and cooks the beans, who walks long distances to fetch water on her head to breastfeed her children. When indigenous elders die from COVID-19, the Nahuatl people language, who, which is an already critically endangered language, and other ancestral knowledges that tie them to the past and that connect them to hope for the future die with them. And from the death of, of the elders, Nahuatl people communities are in danger of losing different ways of knowing, thinking, and being in the world. When indigenous children die from COVID-19, indigenous alterities and futurities also die and the promise that another world is possible with them and for them dissipates. It is in these moments of planetary crisis when indigenous communities in Kushkatan relied on the women's sacred circle to survive. In this space of life, <clears throat> Nahuatl people's worldviews and cosmovision empower women to gather around the sacred fire to offer their ancestral feminist community practices, which they define as the political position to think about the world where they want to live, free from abuse and oppression, exploitation, disease, and death. The Women's Sacred Circle is a space of life that centers the struggles of any woman in any part of this planet who rises up during this pandemic to protect life, revealing herself. It is in the realm of the sacred fire where Nahuatl people women propose decolonial solutions against a lethal virus that threatens to infect and ravage their bodies. Thus, they reconceptualize the COVID-19 pandemic as grounded in patriarchal beliefs. This they frame as a system of all oppressions and violences that humanity endures, men, women, the LGBTQ plus community, children, the elderly, and our mother earth. These oppressions, they state, have historically been built on the bodies and backs of indigenous and Afro-indigenous women. Do not reproduce them on their bodies and survive this pandemic. Indigenous women seek to reposition their struggles against COVID-19 as struggles against ongoing internal colonialism simultaneously. If the exploitation we live under is generated by a capitalist system that man maintains inequality, but becomes that comes from patriarchal logics and is learned on the bodies of women, then we are sustaining capitalism as the unpaid or underpaid labor of women benefits corporations, capitalism, and the colonial patriarchal systems that are not over, they state. Racism and discrimination are also learned on the bodies of women, since the most unvalued body is the body of an indigenous woman. Global racism privileges a white body more than a black or an indigenous body. As such, the exploitation of Mother Earth and all of its inhabitants human or not, it's also sustained on a woman's body, giving birth, raising children, cooking, grinding corn, making tortillas, washing, weaving, working in the maquilas. Everything is sustained on the labor of indigenous women. Everything is extracted from indigenous women's bodies and from our mother earth for others to survive. An oppressed indigenous woman has more oppressions than the most oppressed indigenous man although they both share life within the same, same system of oppressions. But the woman suffers doubly since she is oppressed first because she is indigenous and second because she is a woman. The oppressions and the structural violence of the system are then justified on indigenous bodies. The culture of silence is learned at home when the woman is silenced so that her partner can speak. Therefore, the fight against COVID-19 must be a fight against an exploitive and extractivist racist and patriarchal system, which also oppresses indigenous men. To confront COVID-19 and ensure their survivance, Nahua people women are asking questions of human rights, such as how do we want the circulation of the fruit of our labor that we create with our bodies to be? Will we have a future? What kind of a future awaits us in the context of living life within spaces of death in this pandemic and beyond? In other words, where do we go from here? To answer these questions, indigenous women and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. urge us all to remember community over chaos, that systems of oppression, including patriarchy, are regimes of death that have been killing us for centuries, and how they see the system as killing them 
And now, I'm sorry, they see the system as killing them by robbing them of the sacred air that they need to breathe. Yet they share the same role with us, so many of us, but live in very different conditions. In the indigenous women's sacred circle, they envision conditions of possibility for a different reality from the inherited memory of their grandmothers and grandfathers with a collective look towards the future. Here in the circle, the Nahua people women create humanity and spaces of life that honor and affirm the passing of native, passing of native language and spiritual practices, knowledges of natural medicine and grounded cosmovision that they embody through interweaving ancestral feminine practices of community care every day. So that elders and young can confront and survive the spaces of death that patriarchal systems of oppression and the current COVID-19 pandemic deploy. In this slide, the indigenous women's circles strive to create a dignified world for all, a world with reciprocity and immense hope for the health of our planet. Class Kamati. Thank you very much, Violet, for that um, very um, interesting uh, presentation. I have several questions. I hope I have a chance to answer. But if anyone else has questions, please start uh, filling in the, your uh, Q&A box. Uh, raises a lot of questions. Uh, we turn now to uh, Enrique Beberungen from Leipzig in Germany. Enrique uh, did her Fulbright in Philadelphia. And she's going to be talking about a uh, hackathon in Berlin and I had no, to be honest, I had no idea what a hackathon was until I wrote, read a proposal. I thought it had to do something with coughing and COVID, not to make light of this serious disaster. I apologize for making light of this, but um, it's, she'll tell us what a hackathon is. My son, who's a, a computer game designer, I'm sure would like to see the tape of this. So Enrique, uh, the floor is yours. All right, let's see whether the present presenter mode is going to work. Um, just wait a minute. So, do you see the slide, everyone? Perfect. So, dear Fulbright scholars, dear alumni, dear Fulbright conference team, and dear listeners, I feel very honored to give a talk during the Fulbright Annual Conference. So 2020 has been a whirlwind of a year and many times I've asked myself, where does the world go from here? Never before has this question had such personal impact as this year, not even in a rather abstract climate change debate. COVID-19 has dramatically changed our lives this year. And we were forced to rethink many issues from basic to complex things. Yeah, as Don already said, my name is Henrike Beverung and um, I live and work as a medical doctor in Leipzig, Germany. I've been a Fulbright Scholar in 2013 and 14 at Drexel University in Philadelphia, where I studied neuroscience for a year. My personal game changer this year was the participation in the hashtag via versus virus hackathon, meaning we versus the virus hackathon in March 2020 and all the things that evolved from it, especially for me personally. This talk is about the power of innovation from within the society to solve current social challenges. I want to give you a personal perspective regarding the question, where does the world go from here? All of you know the story of COVID-19. The first cases were reported in Wuhan, China in late 2019. Up until mid of February, life continued as normal in Germany until first actions were taken. Bigger events were canceled and come March, COVID's impact on everyday life accelerated dramatically. By March 15th, all schools were closed, strict border controls were introduced and a week later, public life was shut down, including restaurants, cinemas, playgrounds, etc. Even now, thinking back, it feels kind of unreal. As I work in a hospital, I still went to work every day. But around me, the city was empty when I rode my bike to work and back. 
On 16th of March, Chancellor Merkel called all Germans to show solidarity and discipline in an unprecedented appeal to the nation. And this is where my story begins. In the hospitals, a certain unease began with pictures from Italy and their inability to keep up with all the COVID-19 patients. We were nervous about when and how hard COVID-19 would hit Germany. Just within days, many hospitals and cities all over Germany started looking for volunteers who were willing to help out in clinics and elderly homes in case of a similar spreading pattern. Just about the same time, people from different startups in Berlin and the German government paired to organize the hashtag Beer versus Virus Hackathon, which would become at the time the largest hackathon worldwide. The team called for programmers, designers, creatives, problem solvers, and socially engaged citizens who wanted to build prototypes and find solutions for digital and non-digital social challenges regarding the COVID-19 crisis. This caught my eye and I thought, well, I'm de definitely not a programmer and that's what they usually look for at hackathons. But I'm a socially engaged citizen and I have an idea to tackle one of the current challenges. And with me, over 28,000 people signed up. The organizing team was overwhelmed. Helge Braun, head of the German chancellery, got to the heart of it. Um, many citizens, given the fact of this exceptional worldwide challenge, thought, what can I do? As social contacts were reduced to a few people, this digital event was a great idea to bring people, their ideas and problem solving skills together. Coming back to my daily life and the call for volunteers in the healthcare sector, I asked myself, how can we onboard all the volunteers? As I told you before, gatherings were forbidden, so the usual onboarding process in groups was impossible. Additionally, volunteers eventually had never had contact with nursing, so it wasn't just the usual onboarding process that they had to go through, but an extended one. They would have to learn the basic rules, like when to disinfect their hands and what tasks they had to fulfill in their designated working area. I wanted to create something that helps avoid pictures of exhausted and overwhelmed volunteers. So I signed up for the hackathon with the idea to develop an e-learning platform for volunteers that gathers most, the most important healthcare topics focusing on nursing skills. And that's when it all came together. COVID-19, the hashtag Via versus Virus Hackathon, and my project idea. Having mastered the first hurdle of being accepted as a project while not being strictly typical for a hackathon, it all started on a Friday night after a long day of work in the hospital. Within two hours, the team formed and tasks were assigned. Before, I had never heard of Trello, Slack or DevPos, similar to, I would say, Don Spark's um, Zoomophobia, probably. I thought I couldn't handle it, but the team members made it possible. Tim was a nursing specialist and is now a consultant. Philip, an entrepreneur with economics background. Konrad, a programmer and Susanne, an architect. And that's only a few members of the team. I never before had worked with such driven people who were willing to change something for the better, who were highly motivated and who wanted to tackle the problem of onboarding volunteers in a pandemic. With their motivation and passion and our combined knowledge, we were able to create a running website within about, um, with about 15 courses with, within one weekend. And it was not just my team. As I said before, over 28,000 people participated and worked on over 1,500 projects. The spirit is what made this event extraordinary and something I think has made this hackathon unique and so memorable, at least to me. It was amazing to see how well you can connect online nowadays and how emotions can be transported as well. To see how everyone was determined to solve current social problems inspired me and still does. What has happened since then and how does the story go on? Given immediate action, COVID-19 hasn't hit Germany as hard as some other countries in the world. But restrictions were upheld until the end of April, some even longer. By June, life slowly came back to normal. 
although a new normal with people wearing face masks and keep trying to keep distance. Many people still work from home. The hackathon team together with the federal government of Germany has established the solution enabler and several, several projects received public funding. Projects are given the opportunity to refine their idea, whether it's programming or testing. The broad community, small and big companies, cities and organizations help them in doing so. Our team has continued to work on the idea of onboarding. Luckily, most volunteers haven't yet um, been needed in the healthcare system. So we pivoted our idea towards general healthcare onboarding in hospitals. We changed our initial name from Health Ahenda to Clinic Buddy and are currently testing our idea to partially digitize the onboarding process in hospitals. We want to allow new employees to better prepare themselves for their job, reduce stress, and therefore increase their satisfaction from the beginning. We hope that our tool helps to establish higher standards of care and might decrease job hopping due to a failed onboarding process. In July, we met for the first time in real life. We gathered from all over Germany in Leipzig, and it was great to meet everyone in person. By now, we've met twice. But as we are still living in Hamburg, Munich or Frankfurt, remote work is still what we do most of the time. Slack, Travelo, Google Drive and Zoom have become my new friends and I'm now learning about how to run a business more than I ever thought I would as a doctor. I guess our engineer thinks the same about medicine and healthcare. There are many more, many more projects out there that have a similar history as ours. It's people from diverse backgrounds who never knew each other before, but who have a shared interest to solve a current social challenge. I guess this is what, or this was exactly what the hackathon team had in mind when they organized the event. They never thought the event would become that big and have such impact, but internally that's what they hoped for. This event has inspired many others, and since March, several hackathons have been realized to solve current challenges. From my point of view, innovation from within the society is key in solving big social challenges and has to be used, whether it's discrimination, climate change or poverty. For myself, I can for sure say that this event tore down the barrier and I'll participate in other similar events in the future. I hope this talk gave you a mosaic stone of an answer to the question, where does the world go from here? I was and still am lucky to experience the power from within the society to tackle current social problems. And I hope that you'll soon get a chance as well, whether it's an online hackathon or a live format. The least it will be is an amazing opportunity to grow, whether it be professionally, socially or personally. Thank you all for listening. And um, I personally want to thank the hashtag beer versus virus team for making my amazing experience possible. I will soon not forget it. And special thanks goes out to my helper hand and our clinic buddy team. You're great and it's a lot of fun to work with you. Let's get our message out there. Clinic buddy ready to care. Thank you. Enrique, thank you. Thank you very much for a most impressive story. Um, I was blown away by not only your experience, but, but the potential for um, how this could be a model. And like you said, in climate change, poverty reduction, I can think of dozens of, of areas and um, to be floored by something I didn't even know existed until a few days ago, it just is remarkable. So um, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to hearing some questions and answers in a few moments uh, about this. We move now to, uh, to India where um, Pritash Chakravarti, uh, who did his full body at NYU, will be talking uh, on another topic related to COVID, of course, and um, one close to my heart as an avid uh, comic book collector when I was a child and young adult. Um, I'm quite curious to hear how comics can be used to help uh, educate uh, uh, issues of healthcare, uh, particularly with young people and, and others for that matter, perhaps, so, people who can't read quite as well. So um, uh, Pritesh, uh, the floor is yours. 
Thank you so much, uh, Don. Um, so uh, I am going to speak on this uh, event, this virtual annual conference. Uh, thanks to Fulbright Association for giving me this opportunity to uh, present my views. Can we go to the next slide? Cool. So that's my topic, uh, Go Graphic, Creating Awareness of Healthy Habits Through Comic Books. Um, next slide, please. So according to uh, a number of researchers, uh, it was found that the human brain loves pictures and visuals are processed by brain much faster than words. And a striking characteristic of human memory is that pictures are remembered uh, better than words. And this infographic uh, reinforces what the words have earlier uh, uh, said. And as we uh, know that comic books are an amalgamation of uh, written uh, typed uh, printed words and uh, images. So this image shows that 90% of uh, the communication is visual, 93% of uh, the information that we exchange is visual and even when we are looking at something that is typed or written it is basically uh, visual so visuality uh, which is one of the features of comic books goes a long way in hardwiring certain information that are passed from uh, one person to another or or in this case from uh, authorities to people uh, to make them more aware of healthy habits uh, in in order to fight the covid um, pandemic uh, next slide, please. All right, so as an example, I used this uh, slide uh, to show uh, in right now that even when they, there are like two things uh, uh, which can be compared with each other, there are like this image and the written thing. I believe the first thing that our eyes would be attracted to would be the image uh, which tells us about a, a process of hand washing which will uh, 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 make us safe from the virus from if we have touched a surface that was contaminated and if we wash our hands in this manner then our hands will be uh, infection free. Uh, the same thing is being said uh, on the life, uh, right hand, left hand side uh, and uh, you will read it, but you will read it later. And before that, you will uh, first look at the image, the circular uh, images of the movements of the hands and the way in which the hands needs to be uh, washed uh, before reading uh, the, the, the written uh, material. So pamphleteering versus uh, graphic narratives. Graphic narratives might go a longer way than uh, pamphleteering or just written informations uh, would go. Next slide, please. Now, this image tells us about, makes us aware of the origins of uh, COVID. Uh, this image basically tells us not to indulge in uh, exotic meat, um, bush meat, especially of the bats, because we knew that bats were responsible, uh, uh, bats were carriers of this uh, virus and they got transmitted into the human uh, body uh, from eating these kinds of um, exotic uh, meats. So this image is uh, hard, tries to hardwire the idea that you should avoid these uh, kinds of exotic food as far as possible. Next image, please. Okay, so uh, this is another image that reinforces uh, the earlier image of avoiding the bushmeat because it shows the way in which these things can be transmitted from the animals to the human beings and then from uh, one person, one human being to uh, another and vice versa. I mean, we can't infect the animals, but we can infect uh, each other if we um, uh, do not uh, uh, avoid the, the food if we do not avoid and not follow the basic instructions that have been uh, told to us. Next slide. So uh, how does it spread? Now this uh, image, these images and the uh, written uh, information that are uh, presented as well show that they can be spread through the sneezing or coughing of an infected person onto uh, another person who might be uh, around or those if somebody is infected and his he touches a surface then that surface is touched by someone else or it can be it can uh, go directly from somebody's mouth while somebody is speaking into somebody who is near that person these uh, 
this virus can be transmitted through um, air also and through the little uh, droplets that are released when we speak in, in, in form of saliva, in form of some other uh, oral uh, fluids. So uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, the earlier image was about uh, the infection spreading from person to person. This image shows us as to how the infection can uh, spread exponentially, how, how it, it happens in a, in a community. Uh, in a country uh, like India, which is uh, overpopulated, uh, we, do not, we, we can't uh, maintain social distancing as much as we want to. So uh, the community spread has been really very quick in India. India had been on the number one spot. And this image uh, could tell us as to how this uh, had happened and how this could go still further if we do not maintain the, uh, the social distancing, if we do not maintain uh, hygiene. Next slide, please. Okay, so what does it do to the body and how? Um, the, the virus ultimately attaches itself to the cells of the lungs, makes it weak, and when the lung uh, collapses, the person eventually dies if the person is not given uh, proper uh, health care. So uh, from the mouth, through the throat, down to the lungs, this is how the virus uh, affects, uh, and this is what ultimately is being done by the virus. Next slide, please. So there are 12 symptoms of uh, COVID-19 and any person can have any one of them, but not all of them. Uh, so fever or chills, cough, shortness of dif uh, breathing, uh, difficulty in breathing, fatigue, muscle or body ache, headache, uh, loss of taste, loss of smell, sore throat, congestion, uh, nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. And since these images are in the panel format, in the comic book format, um, any one of these can take the center stage while the other can go uh, uh, take the back seat. And uh, we should be aware of all of these uh, symptoms that if any one of this is recurring in, in, in a person, then that person should uh, go to the doctor and uh, take medical advice. Next slide, please. Now, uh, the government of India uh, issued a, a pamphlet, a comic book uh, really, in, uh, in order to spread awareness, which is named as Kids, Vayu and Corona. Vayu is supposed to be a, a kind of a superhero wearing formal dress and a cape, wearing, uh, taking a red soda, and he's taking the fight to the Corona monster who is like in the black. And this is uh, done uh, to spread awareness among uh, the children, uh, especially. Next slide, please. So this image shows as to how um, uh, Vayu, who is the fight, uh, who is the fighter against uh, this coronavirus, uh, emanates uh, five um, steps to prevent um, uh, corona. So washing hands, uh, maintaining uh, hygiene, maintaining distance, um, uh, taking care of yourself when you're infected, and going to the going to the medical uh, person, going to the doctor whenever you feel uh, unsafe or unwell. This, these things, when visualized, uh, gives us a kind of not only an information, but also a kind of a positive feeling that the coronavirus might be defeated if we are uh, following these uh, steps, because here the coronavirus seems to be in a tight spot. Next slide, please. This is more in the form of a direct uh, comic book narrative, direct graphic narrative, where these kids are asking as to how the virus spreads and, and the superhero is telling them as to how it does. And he's reinforcing whatever has already been said in, in TV commercials, in uh, informations given directly by the government, but this is visually more appealing. And hence, according to the research earlier mentioned, uh, people, uh, especially children, could try to remember them in a, in a far uh, better way, especially uh, in India, where uh, many children are school dropouts, many children cannot attend, uh, to the, uh, attend the schools, um, and they are more vulnerable to these kinds of uh, uh, contagious diseases uh, because they have no awareness, these images um, can help uh, to some extent uh, make them aware of the situation and to tell them as to what they can do in order to uh, avoid it. Next slide, please. 
Now, testing is again another way of preventing or trying to uh, fight with this um, uh, virus. There are two types of testing: the swab testing and the blood testing. The images uh, in 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 association makes them uh, obvious. Next slide. So now this is more comic bookish again. Uh, so there's this uh, in the, on the on the top of the uh, slide is this uh, comic book superhero called Nagraj, and he is saying that he has to spread the message, and he is he uses snakes that lives and live in his uh, body to fight crime, but now he is using the same to fight uh, the Corona Man as he has been. Uh, given this uh, nomenclature. The snakes, as you can see, are spreading the message to all the people. Uh, they are asking them to stay home and wash their hands. The images uh, are all uh, uh, emblematic or sim symbolic of what can be done and how the doctors and the policemen are trying to uh, do their best. These images, when they are seen uh, in, a, in a kind of a um, uh, symbolic uh, way, these images uh, with the snakes carrying these uh, images are haunting and I believe they could go a very long way in order to make people remember to stay home or um, so next slide yes um, so here uh, the uh, monster is made more or less uh, from abstract to uh, kind of uh, concrete where uh, the superheroes are fighting. But what is more interesting is the uh, speech bubble in the blue, which says that uh, we should not go very near to the virus because we can get affected too. And it's a kind of an overkill by the use of the mask because the superheroes, most of them wear masks anyway. And these superheroes are wearing extra masks. So telling the people that even superheroes can get affected people i mean it's uh, easy uh, for the common people to get affected uh, by the same virus next slide please thank you now uh, police uh, has been instrumental in trying to keep people home which is one of the ways in which uh, in india uh, we have tried to uh, maintain uh, the social distancing and trying to keep people in the home is difficult, but the police have been doing uh, uh, the job. The other image, the image on the right, where the superhero tries to tell the people to stay home and uh, be safe, uh, and they are they are coming out in herds, but uh, the superhero, as well as the uh, juxtaposed uh, authorities, they are both trying to make this balance and try to make uh, um, uh, people stay home, which is one of the ways initially with which uh, India had tried to uh, fight back this um, outbreak. Next slide, please. Now, uh, talking of preventions uh, and talking of ways out, uh, this these images actually show as to how the virus affects uh, individuals and what happens when the herd morality, herd uh, immunity, sorry, herd immunity is um, uh, brought out and how it can uh, I confine the virus into a kind of a isolated pocket, eventually uh, uh, trying to finish it. Why, can we go to the next slide? Sorry. While we wait for uh, the vaccine to come, which uh, is uh, which this image shows that the vaccine vaccine is in the stage of development, and uh, the scientist is trying to uh, create the virus, but the virus is already at the doors, and the people are clamoring for it. So, vaccine could be also another way in which we can uh, fight uh, the virus. We can defeat it, but we have to uh, wait for it. Next slide, please. So if you are get infected, uh, even then you need to uh, wash your hands regularly so that you do not contaminate other uh, surfaces. Stay home, uh, work from home, stay in a place which is isolated from other members of the family, the caregiver and you, whenever you come into contact should wear masks. Uh, sneeze on the elbows and not on your uh, hands. So these associative images uh, try to tell what to do once you get uh, infected. Next slide. So after recovery, once you do recover, eventually 
uh, you can do is what you can do is you know, uh, donate uh, plasma for other COVID-19 patients. But then there are some do's and don'ts as well, which this this image tries to show that if you are less than 65, if you're not having any kind of transmissible uh, diseases, then you should uh, go forward and uh, donate the plasma. Next slide, please. Which I think is the last one. Yes. So namaste and uh, thank you very much uh, for your uh, time and patience. If you have any questions and suggestions other than the Q&A, you can email here. Thank you so much. Don, you there? Pritesh, yes, Pritesh, thank you very much for a um, very, uh, yet another very interesting presentation. I can see how such a mode of communication, particularly in a society where literacy is low, can be very powerful and effective. Um, and I want to have some questions as well. Hopefully we'll have time for, uh, for these. And lastly, uh, Julianne uh, Rolf, who was a PhD candidate in chemical and environmental engineering at Yale, who did her Fulbright in Germany. Uh, by the way, um, we have a German theme here today. And as you may know, uh, Angela Merkel was the last winner of the Fulbright Prize last year, accepted it on behalf of the Fulbright Association, just as a plug for, for Angela Merkel in Germany. Uh, so Julianne, we're talking about water distillation using solar uh, power. I think not directly related to COVID, but certainly implications for, for clean water, which as everyone knows, particularly in the developing world, is a major uh, form of waterborne disease, particularly with young children and infants suffer dramatically for uh, unclean water. Not as big a problem in the developed world, but certainly huge in the developing world. I'm very curious, having spent a lot of time in the developing world, I'm very curious to hear uh, the applications for Julianne's presentation. So please, uh, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much for that introduction. Okay, so hopefully you can see this now. Let's see if it loads. <laughs> Let me switch screens. Yeah, so like Don said, my name's Julianne. I'm from Yale University and I did my Fulbright in 2016 to 2017. And uh, my research today is going to be talking to you about reimagining water treatment for rural and water scarce communities and potential for solar energy powered membrane distillation technology. So that's kind of a handful or a mouthful. So hopefully I'll be able to break it down for you and you can understand uh, how we can potentially solve the water crisis that's occurring. Great, so I'm gonna first start with acknowledgements. So we have a huge team. Uh, it's very international in Fulbright fashion. So we have someone from ASU, Carnegie Mellon, uh, Lone Star College in Texas, Rice University, uh, Sol Mim, which is a, our uh, professional industry collaborator, uh, Stanford University, as well as UCLA, UTEP, and of course, Yale, my advisor, Minnie Elamelik, who actually is, was a Fulbrighter last fall in Israel before COVID hit, and as well as my entire team, uh, our lab mates, they're really great and supportive. And I'd also like to thank my funding sources, Yale, NSF, GRFP, as well as Newt, which is the reason we have this collaboration, as well as Fulbright for allowing me to present following three amazing presentations. So my first question to all of you is when you turn on the sink, do you ever wonder if water is gonna come out of the faucet? Well, if you're like me, the answer is probably no, but many Americans actually don't even know where their water comes from or how it's treated. And that leads to us taking for granted our water. And something that, um, something that not everyone can do because billions of people are without water around the world. And so, oops, I'm so sorry. So, this leads me to the, uh, my introduction, is what are the top three risks threatening humanity? So when you think of um, risks that are threatening humanity, you may think of um, the US leaving the Iran deal or the Cold War. And the first risk is weapons of mass destruction, where not, necessar not necessarily something that directly threatens us every single day, but the threat is always there. And according to the World Economic Forum, it's one of the top risks in um, threatening humanity. So the next one 
is extreme weather events where if you're in the United States, you hear a lot of stories about hurricanes, uh, tornadoes. Um, you obviously have other types of uh, weather events that can kill people. And it's one of the, um, it's the second most uh, threatening risk to humanity. And it's something that kills people every year. And, uh, and one thing that uh, we should all note is that climate change is causing these events to increase in frequency as well as increase in the, uh, the severity of them. So the threat is only increasing every year as we don't uh, address climate change. And so this leads me to what is the third risk that threatens humanity. So if you're like me, a big water person, it comes easy to guess. But if you're not, um, the, the answer is water scarcity. And why is that? So 2.2 billion people don't have access to safely managed drinking water. And what does that mean? That means it's one in four people around the world don't have water, which is a huge amount. And many of us live in the developed world don't even think about this. And so where are these people located that actually deal with severe water shortages? So if you see this map here, it is a map of water scarcity in the number of months a year where more water is withdrawn and used than replenished. And most of these locations are uh, in regions of North America, Asia, and Africa along the equator, as well as in the Southern Hemisphere, um, like uh, the Southern Africa, as well as Australia. And I'm from California, my home state. And so this issue of water scarcity is both professional and personal. And if you're not in the developed world, what are, um, I wanna explain what some of the implications are, but the causes are the same regardless. So one is climate change, which I already hinted at, as well as pollution and illegal dumping, which is a huge issue, especially um, near, um, when you live near water, uh, surface waters. Also certain farming practices can lead to overuse as well as uh, pollution in waterways, droughts, floods, natural disasters, excessive water consumption. So I, I know um, many of you aren't from the United States, but we are well known for using way too much water compared to um, a per person basis in, every, in other countries. Uh, overpopulation. So we're at 7.8 billion people in the world, which is going to increase to over 8 billion fairly soon. And that, all those people need water to survive. And we aren't the only species that needs water to survive. So it's a really big concern. Corruption. I mean, we see this with governments as well as companies and nonprofits. Corruption can lead to less water availability, uh, especially treated drinking water. Political interests. So Climate change has been politicized in the United States, which we have seen, and it's something that uh, water access, even in the United States, is not available for everyone. So it's uh, political interests play a huge part, as well as wars and conflicts. And um, my personal favorite is electricity, because you can't really treat water without electricity. So what are some of the effects of this? Migration, so you're seeing people move, especially with the waters rising, you're seeing people move. Um, so they're called climate, um, climate migrants, poverty, and lower le levels of education. So as uh, Violet actually hinted at, uh, water uh, scarcity actually is more of a, a gender issue too, because women are more likely to be the ones that go and retrieve water for their families. So if you don't have water, you also have decrease in crop yields, which leads to hunger, starvation, as well as without water, you, you can uh, become thirsty. And when you don't have the resources you need to be healthy, you can have a weaker immune system as well as unhygienic conditions. And just to tie this in, because we are the COVID health uh, uh, se uh, segment, um, it also can help with spreading diseases because as you probably have learned from your government or even um, the last presentations, um, um, graphics, if you don't wash your hands, you're likely to uh, get COVID. Also, destruction of habitats, endangerments of species, loss of biodiversity. So this isn't something that just affects us, but we are one of the main causes for uh, water scarcity. And climate and war. So there actually are more climate or conflicts happening, excuse me, climate conflicts and war. There are more conflicts happening because of water access. And this is seen um, not just in, um, in, in the government, but also in physical conflicts that um, are leading to more people dying. So how do we increase access? I mean, you see our beautiful planet and you think we have so much water, but it's not that simple. So the, wa the earth is covered by over 70% water. 
And sadly, only 2.5% of that is fresh water, which means we can drink it. But less than 1% of that 2.5% is actually accessible water for us to drink, which means that of all the 71% of water that is on this planet, we can't drink almost all of it directly because it's either stuck in ice cores or is polluted or is too salty. So it's something that is a serious problem, especially with climate change and our growing population. And so can potentially desalination be the solution? So this presentation is about rural and water scarce communities. So what does that mean? When you have desalination in these communities and you don't have electricity, you can't really accomplish that, right? So just as an example, Africa, uh, the continent of Africa, over um, 60 million people don't have electricity and that's over 70% of the population. And then, oops, there we go. So how do we address this in rural uh, water scarce communities? One, the system needs to be decentralized which in developed worlds, most of our systems are centralized and it goes out to large areas, but in rural areas, it really needs to be decentralized. So it address, it's for the specific community you're in. Also, it needs to be off grid, which means if you don't have electricity, you can still get clean access or clean water access. And also, you also need a reliable water source, which isn't always an issue. It's just sometimes the water source isn't clean enough to drink or healthy enough to drink. And so that's why you need to treat it with desalination. So this, so did all of this could lead to good water quality that is available to drink. And so of all the different types of desalination processes, which one could we potentially use? So my group, we're looking at using solar powered membrane distillation, which uh, isn't that complicated of a system, but it also is very effective in, uh, in being able to provide water to rural communities. So this system is, um, can be very modular so it can be off or can be decentralized and a small unit that doesn't take up too much land space but what's important because it needs to be off grid is that it's solar powered and uh, so when you combine those two you actually can achieve all those things that you need in order to be successful in providing water to rural communities so uh, membrane distillation membrane is hydrophobic and microporous the system is, um, is driven by a vapor pressure difference due to a difference in temperature between the feed and the permeate. What's great about MD is it's not limited by salinity and it also can achieve up to 100% theoretical rejection just in one step, which is not typical of other membrane desalination processes. It also can be used for zero liquid discharge applications, maybe not necessarily needed in rural areas, but can be used in other environmental issues or regions that um, have high discharge regulations. And so MD can operate in four different uh, setups. So direct contact, air gas, um, sweeping gas, as well as vacuum MD. So all of those have their pros and cons, but it all serves the same purpose. You have a hot feed side and then a cool um, permeate side in order to condense the water on the, the after the membrane. And so how do we do this? The obvious answer is directly heat the water in the system in order to provide hot heated feed side. So this has actually been done and proven by teams both at Yale as well as Rice University using nanophotonics to enable um, the solar membrane distillation system, which is, um, this is a great, um, this is literally on a cart that you would use um, in a lab. So it's very small and um, it can produce um, enough water for a, um, for a single person, especially in rural areas that don't use very much water. So it's something that is definitely available and you can scale it up so it can be used for an entire community. So indirectly are where um, I wanna focus on a little bit more. So if in all MD sim systems, you need an MD module, which holds the membrane, you need a thermal energy source. So in our case, we're using solar, an electric power source, which also can be solar, as well as heat exchangers to make sure you're, you have two different uh, temperatures to help drive the membrane distillation system. And so you, have, uh, you can have a solar powered MD using flat plate collectors, which I'll show a picture of in the next slide, as well as solar powered MD using evacuated tube collectors, which I'll show after, as well as solar pond powered MD, which is a little bit more unique, but also uses the advantage of the sun 
and which I won't talk about, but you can also use uh, PV technology to help actually make the system off the grid as well as solar storage tanks to help keep the water um, stored, especially if you're not using the system um, all the time. And so indirect solar MD is pretty simple. You have your collector with your lenses and the reflector helps uh, increase the amount of solar energy you can get. And this, um, this is the MD module, as well as this is the condenser, which you have the influent brine go through in order to help provide the cool side. And so this system is circular in order to treat the water where you get your treated water on this side of the membrane. So it's, it's fairly simple and, and one of the, the easiest um, forms you can do indirect solar with. And then you can have indirect with um, evacuated tube collectors, which can help with the efficiency. And so it's a similar concept where you have your um, heat exchanger with the evacuated tube collectors in order to help this process heat the feed. And then you end up with treated uh, permeate on the other side. And there's two different common types of evacuated tube collectors, which um, it really is just a matter of what your system is and the efficiency you want to achieve, especially when you're off-grid efficiency is really important because you only have so much uh, resources in order to, to run the whole system. And so something that really won't be used too much in rural areas, but can be used depending on how, how large your system is, as well as how efficient and advanced you want your system to be. But you can actually concentrate the solar energy that you get in order to um, either heat the water or provide more, um, uh, more power to make the system off grid. So there's three different main kinds, which is the parabolic uh, chore collector, solar panel towers, as well as linear uh, Frenzel reflectors. But when you're in a rural area, you really don't care about those too, too much uh, unless you want to be efficient. But typically you're going to be using uh, solar photovoltaic panels in order to provide your system to be off grid. And so this is this system actually has been proven. Uh, we have had successful pilot plants around the world. So Aquastil in the Netherlands and Solar Spring have been really great in showing that um, these small MD systems up here on the top can be successful. And then um, there's actually an institute in Germany that is um, proving that this all can be used together with um, an example here of a solar powered MD system that uh, can be used anywhere in the world uh, to provide water for people, which is amazing. So I ask before we conclude, have we achieved all of our goals? The answer is yes, right? It, we can make a decentralized system. It can be off grid. And if we have a reliable water source, we can provide good quality water. So in conclusion, one in four people lack access to water and one in eight people lack access to electricity. So these UN sustainability goals six and seven are important to address, especially before their deadline of 2030. And so can we do this with solar powered MD? The answer is yes. And we can de we've demonstrated through um, industrial members that this is feasible, especially with our pilot plants that have been all around the world. So with that, I thank you uh, for letting me present and I welcome any questions you may have. Panelists, um, all four of you, thank you very much. I've uh, moderated dozens of academic conferences around the world the last 30 or 40 years. First time ever, uh, all four panelists did their presentations exactly on time. Not only that, that's what's important. Not only that, these were some of the most amazing uh, presentations I've heard in a long time as well. The, I was struck by the interrelationship between the overlap between all four. For example, in the uh, in Violet's case of um, indigenous uh, peoples, I'm sure lack of uh, clean water is an issue. Uh, literacy and understanding proper medical uh, sanitation is an issue. Um, I can see that um, the comic books could, could, could help in this situation. Uh, desalinating water could help. I mean, these are all so interrelated that um, this is, is profound actually. We have a number of questions. We won't have a chance, unfortunately, to get to them all. We have about only about 50, less than 15 minutes left. I'll start though, I'll start very quickly with a compliment from an anonymous Peace Corps volunteer who said, no question, just wanted to say that all the panelists have been amazing. I especially love the graphic novel and can't wait to see more of these initiatives like Clinic Buddy in the United States. So I second that as a compliment. Um, so again, there's so many here, I'm trying to, trying to uh, co uh, coordinate them. Um, Several to, um, well, to Violet to start. Violet, a question from Danielle asked uh, about issues in El Salvador. Are there 
uh, what, are the, what are the water conditions for the indigenous people? And what are the links between access and internal and external displacement exacerbated by COVID-19? And how did your time during your full body research inform your work related to healthy health equity issues? If you could be brief, please. Yes, thank you so much for the question. Um, you know, water is at the heart of the external and internal displacement of people. Um, for one, El Salvador is going through a six year in row of drought. Secondly, 99% of all rivers in El Salvador are contaminated with fecal waste. Um, they also, um, I think, you know, gangs also pose a problem because they prevent access to people to go get water and to also grow their food, right? And lastly, you know, environmental reports and, um, you know, predictions for the future are telling us that in 80 years, if we keep going at this pace, El Salvador will be an uninhabitable space. So I think they're all very related. Um, and with COVID-19, you know, having water as Julianne and everybody else have said it, you know, water is life, is critical to not contaminate each other and, and to survive the pandemic. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. This question goes to Enrique. One was from Jay Nathan, a, a Fulbright board member who just said that uh, you're a role model for social, socially engaging citizenship. Thank you very much, Enrique. John Bader, who's the director of the uh, Fulbright Association, executive director asked, is it possible for collaborative partnerships to start online or does a meaningful relationship require at least some in-person time? I can see how to continue online relationships established in person, but can it work the other way, Enrique? Yeah, thank you, John, for your question. Um, I already tried to text you um, an answer, and um, I think you're talking about my project Clinic Buddy. So um, Clinic Buddy is about the onboarding process, and um, you can partially digitize the onboarding process, I would say. So um, especially the pre-boarding process can be um, digitalized by an app or platform. And um, then when it comes to the job start, I mean, it has to be both, right? So it needs to be in person and also, um, yeah, you can par partially digitize um, some lectures in the beginning. And um, I think especially in the healthcare sector, it's very important to um, have the um, in-person onboarding part as um, we are doing a lot of practical works. So um, everybody needs to know like, how to um, yeah, do certain procedures, I would say. Um, so just having done an e-learning course, course isn't enough. So um, yeah, it would be great to have the e-learning course first and then second to have the um, in-person onboarding. So um, yeah, I hope that kind of answered your question. Uh, let me know if you have further questions. Thank you, Enrique. Um, Again, I'm, I'm sifting through several questions here. Uh, Pritesh, a couple of questions in the comment. One, um, uh, also from, from John Bader, who said that uh, this is a wonderful way to make public health information more accessible. Are there efforts to share this using more stories rather than images, building narratives with characters? The superheroes seem a promising way to do this. And a related question uh, by Sharon Silverman. Sharon asked to, uh, to Pritesh, could you clarify about herd uh, immunity? Uh, she seemed to think you heard said that herd immunity is recommended, and she doesn't believe that's necessarily a valid point. Could you comment on those two, please? Yeah, I mean, uh, the first one is I, I tried to answer it in the uh, comment box itself. Yes, as we speak, uh, many uh, comic book companies uh, which produce comic books indigenously in India are writing narratives uh, on uh, the ways in which we can combat uh, the COVID, what we can do after the COVID is over, how uh, individual stories uh, have been uh, aired through this uh, medium. So yeah, there is a lot of uh, uh, narratives uh, that are being constructed and I have just taken a, a few pictures, few images from them. So there's a lot of things uh, going on right now. I mean, Corona has become an industry, not just in a kind of a commercial way, but also in a, in a kind of a graphic narrative way. So there's a lot of Corona thing going on in comic books as well. And um, the second question, yes, um, it is not, uh, it has not been validated yet. Uh, it, there's still confusion over that, but uh, my own experience in Kolkata, I am from Kolkata uh, in India, where we have seen that uh, after being affected en masse, 
uh, people who have uh, got the immunity have been able to break the chain between two uh, uh, two uh, uh, areas where uh, where corona had uh, impacted where covid was there and due to this pocket of uh, immune immunized uh, people the chain of the 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 infection has broken down somewhat but yes of course i mean i'm not a doctor or a medical person i i can't comment on that but my uh, personal experience has shown some positive uh, things as far as uh, herd immunity is uh, concerned. And Pritesh, could I follow up with a question? Um, your, your comics illustrated stories, are they really, really geared more towards kids or is it because of, of literacy issues in India? Is it also more for adults as well? Um, well, it starts from the kids, but uh, as you said, that uh, literacy is an issue with adults as well. So people who cannot uh, really read either English or Hindi, uh, uh, they, the, the comic books help break the barriers for uh, the non-English uh, and Hindi speaking uh, communities as well, because most of the literature around Corona or COVID is produced in the Hindi or the English language, which is not uh, really, which does not penetrate into the hills or the other rural areas where some other languages are spoken. Uh, India is a very diverse uh, linguistic uh, community. So yes, uh, they are also geared towards um, the adults uh, as well. And, and also not just for uh, people who are illiterate, but also people who belong to different linguistic communities. And that's a good thing, I believe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, dozens of questions left. Uh, this is for Julianne. Uh, question from, um, oops, I just had it, pardon me. Where was it? Well, my question, Julianne, was uh, you talked about scalability and uh, simplicity for your MD project. What about cost? I didn't hear anything about cost. How, how realistic is it for a developing world uh, with regard to cost? Yeah, so MD is actually one of the cheaper uh, cost-wise just because it, um, it, like, it doesn't require high pressure. It's just thermal, but it can be expensive if, um, depending on the resources that you use and the, the parts that you use, but it can be one of the cheaper ones because RO um, requires high pressure pumps and things like that, which can uh, make it not feasible in rural areas. But in terms of the value per unit, I'm not entirely sure. This is still a fairly new um, uh, technology, especially in for rural areas. So it's something that definitely needs to be explored. Okay, and then uh, Juliana, uh, for you as well, an anonymous attendee asked, how does your system differ from that of source, global PBC? Are there partnership opportunities here? Yeah, so I, I briefly looked it up when I saw the question and it, it's very similar. It does use solar power, but the way it treats is different. So MD is a thermal process, which can be a little bit more energy intensive because it requires, um, because it requires water to be heated, but depending on the, the location of the system, it's not that much more energy to heat up water because um, you're usually in these water scarce areas that have lots of sunlight and so the solar energy can be helpful, but that system uses more of a, a material that absorbs the condensation. So it's instead of the, the vapor going through the membrane, which is how ours is treated, the, their system seems to have the water condense onto the material and that's how the water is collected. Okay, I'll put you on the spot with one last uh, follow-up question from John Bader. Uh, I don't think he means this in a critical way, but he's saying that uh, isn't the um, real issue here uh, a better way to have a carbon neutral power source for sustainable energy? That way we can desolidize without any worry on a very large scale. So isn't the real issue here lack of, of sustainable power? Yeah, so, I, so this is system is definitely trying to be off-grid where it uses a renewable energy source in that everything um, isn't, I mean, obviously these, all, everything needs to be made and it's usually produced where there isn't renewable energy. So it will be producing carbon emissions when it's the systems being designed and transported. But overall, the system can be off grid and use a renewable energy source. It's just a matter of, of the location as well as the feasibility in terms of um, applying this to communities. I know that um, 
some communities don't like technology. They like their way of life. And it's something where they see that uh, Westerners are imposing our, uh, our technology on others. And so it's something that uh, if it can be completely off grid and maintained by community members, it can be successful. But in terms of carbon emissions, it's, um, it's something that if it's off grid and using renewable energy, it won't impact. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we are quickly running out of time, so no more time for questions. I would like to end by thanking most of all the four panelists who did an amazing job this afternoon. Uh, I can't thank you enough. I also would like to thank the staff of the Fulbright Association, particularly Munir and Shaws, who uh, did a lot of behind the scenes technology that we could never figure it out. I would like to end on the note by saying that this, this experience reminds me why we're all so passionate about the Fulbright program. And the next time that Fulbright um, supporters go to Capitol Hill in Washington to uh, try to persuade uh, legislators to add uh, to the program as, as opposed to cutting it, I wish we could show them this program, uh, get them in a room and show them, what, make them, what, not make them, but allow them, invite them to watch this. I think they would come away amazed by the um, possibilities that each individual presenter has come up with today. And as I mentioned earlier, the overlapping and intertwined ideas that uh, can be applicable across borders, across societies, across economies. And for that, I uh, wish to compliment you all in your presentations. Uh, audience, thank you very much for your questions. We didn't answer them all, I'm afraid, because of time. But uh, I look forward to the remaining part of this uh, wonderful conference. Uh, to everyone, please stay healthy and a safe journeys back home. <laughs>